Take your Bibles, please. First Corinthians 15. Uh, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. We've got ushers on the side to get one to you. We're a Bible reading, teaching church. Don't just quote a verse and close it. We study from it. How are you guys doing? Good? All right. Good, good. Do you like new things? You know, it seems like our product world, our product-minded world, they seem to need to always come out with something that's new and improved. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Well, I remember trying new and improved Tang. It didn't taste any different than old Tang. Wasn't exactly sure what that was all about, but they called it new and improved. New and improved Tide. Hey, the clothes came out clean before and they came out clean again. Woohoo! Okay, whatever it may be to get us to purchase, but we, they recognize that we have a desire for things that are new and improved. Well, today we're going to look at a promise of God that is Garen's barbarians, pigeon kind, that we are going to get something new and improved. But before we get there, let's jump back to where we finished off last week. If you recall last week, we looked at the passages there that spoke about baptism for the dead and spoke about a practice that is done by a church that believes that you can be baptized for someone else who has already died and being doing so, they could be saved. We looked at, that is why we don't even do infant baptism here as a church. We believe the Bible is very clear that it is confessional salvation. A person professes themselves that Jesus Christ is Lord. You must repent and be baptized. And a dead person, nor can a baby, repent. We cannot have this for someone else. And so baptism is an outward sign of an inward movement. It's something God has got a hold of the individual. And so if you recognize what we said last week, that the key to one's salvation is personal belief, personal submission, and personal profession of faith. No one, no one can have enough faith for someone else. We must recognize our own individual need and individually, independently respond. Amen? So what does that mean? Again, let me share with everyone that's in here. Just because your mom and dad are Christians, pastors, missionaries, grandmother is, you grew up in a Christian home, that does not make you a Christian. The fact that I have bananas and apples in my home right now does not make me a banana or an apple. Some of you might be going, yeah, but you're still a fruit. All right, fine, whatever. But nonetheless, recognizing just the ominous presence of something does not make us one. It is a personal profession and confession. And the thing is, is that we ourselves cannot do things of a personal commitment for other people. We cannot be hungry for somebody else. Even try as we may. Do you remember your mom? Do you remember every time she got cold, we had to put on a jacket? It's cold. Put on a jacket. I'm not cold. Yes, you are. Here, eat this. I'm not hungry. Yes, you are. Eat this. You're laughing, so you had the same mom. And I'm like, like what is up with this? You see, because we have this, we sometimes think maybe we can love enough for two. Some of you in this room, and I don't mean to pick on wounds, but you found that not to be so. That you entered into a relationship where you saw him or her kind of waffling, but you felt, hey, once we tie the knot, once we, then he will, then she will, and we will, and yet you recognize that that's not the case. So when it comes clearly to the point of the love affair with Jesus Christ, he loves you. He died on a cross for you. The question is, not what you call him, but what does he call you? Have you entered in person and said, yes, Jesus, be now my Lord and Savior. And that is a very critical part for us. We also look like the fact that, looked at the fact that we need to not follow the crowd that's all into the now. One of the things my dad taught me as a young man, how he got me through school. Being the extremely ADD one who was never, you know, in the present room and so on and so forth. My dad used to say this to me over and over. And I pray this will help someone here today. He would say, son, do not sacrifice tomorrow at the price of today. Do not sacrifice tomorrow at the price of today. See, he knew that when the swells would come, I don't know why, but always a perfect six foot glassy no wind swell would come right at finals. 
It would always come right when there was some critical junction in my life that would have forever permanent bearing. And he would see, you could see me sitting in the chair twitching. There's waves that are breaking, Dad. And he would look me in the eye and say, do not throw away tomorrow at the price of today. You see, we live so much in the now. And yet, often we hear a phrase when people say, hey, stop acting like animals. You know what an insult that is to the animals? Because even the animals themselves store up and prepare for the future. The little squirrels, the little birds, you know, you go and you find the birds nest everywhere. They're preparing. Are we preparing for the fact that there is a future today? Should your life be called of you? Are you ready for such a call? Do you know that when it comes time to die, all you have to do is die? Or is there a need to make right, to make pono, as we say, with someone and particularly the God of the universe? I was at a meeting this week. And please hear me clearly on this. Where it was kind of an eclectic gathering of people for this think tank. And a gentleman introduced himself. He said, hi, my name is such and such. And I am a Jewish, Christian, Sufi, Muslim, Baha'i, Hindi. And of course, because it was a corporate setting, it was all I could do just to sit there. And just go... But oh, the wisecracker in me. When it came my turn to introduce myself, did I want to stand up and say, Hi, my name is Waxer Tipton and I'm an African American. I want to say this to us today in love. And yes, maybe my sarcasm, please don't take it wrong if you're a visitor with us and think that it, it's a cockiness. No, it's, it's the way this brain works. But the very fact that if I was to stand in front of a group of people who are African-American and say to them, I am an African-American, they would say, no, you're not. By the very definition of what one is, you ain't, white boy. <laughs> but you see, people have come to understand because of what we've been reading here about the salad bar Christianity, like this, like this, don't like this, don't like this, I'll grab this. Now they feel they can call themselves Christian, and yet the very phrase Christian says, I am one who believes that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through Him. When I have a president who defines himself as Christian, and yet the choices that he is making do not reflect that of what the Bible is teaching, calling oneself one thing and living it is completely different. Hi, my name is Wachter Tipton, and I'm an African-American. No. And today, you may say, I agree with this and this and this and this with Christianity, and that's wonderful, you're close. But today, are you going to say that God is God and I'm not, and I'm going to learn to deal with it? Because His Word is final. And the best part about it is when you start trusting that Word, it's a good thing. See, here is the key to the rest of the sermon, to the rest of the book. Hear me clearly, people. You cannot love, you cannot truly worship a principle or a promise. You see, that is why many of you here today as Christians, many of you who are the philosophically minded, find the very depth of your core empty. In fact, many will say, hey, I just like to come for the teaching time because I don't really connect with the singing before or the singing after. That just, it's not my bag. Well, you see, the thing is, is it's not until you know the person do you fall in love with the person and not the principle or the promise. You see, my passion in Christianity is not these promises, but the person behind the promise. And that's where I find the power. Jesus loves me. Now, Billy Graham was famous for saying, and the Bible says. And he would quote the word of God, which is true. But I want to take that one step further into a generation that is now trying to reduce the Bible as one of many holy books. No, my Savior Jesus, my Papa God, He has promised this unto me. Amen? Our friends, our co-workers need to know that we do not have a mist or a force, but we have a lover and a friend and a father in Jesus. 
What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, with needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to Him in prayer. You see, today, do you have a personal relationship? And I say this not to be arrogant or cocky, but someone here today might say, dude, that sounds nice and good and all, but how do you know that Jesus is alive, that God exists, and everything you're saying is true? Simple. He and I have been talking all morning together. Very simple. You have no idea how many times half the stuff I'm saying to you are not even on these notes. I come up and he says, okay, boy, here's my heart for my people. Let's talk. Amen? That's where he is for us. You see, the human beings are the only creatures that have not lived up to their potential. I'd like you to see something if you could.
right here, right now. Don't you find it interesting? This is a secular study done by a secular group that was doing all of these studies. And what did it show us? With all this technological advancement, all of these things that have just so increasingly, exponentially just blew up, bloomed and blossomed, we are still morally bankrupt. Did you pick up on that? We have all this internet capacity, but where are we? we're still ripping off. Now, again, I didn't put that, the church didn't put that together. And I'm just sitting there. Somebody sent that to me last week and I was like, holy smokes. That's why when we read Romans, we read Corinthians, and we look at our newspaper, we're like, wow, same world. Same world. You see, we have all these technological advancements, but have they done anything? Have we as human beings advanced at all to be the kind of people that God needs to transform this world? That's why I want you to pick up with me, if you would, please, at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. And that is why we must take this verse to heart. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, where it says to us quite clearly, it says, do not be deceived. Help me out. What's it say? Bad company corrupts good morals. Now, this is a verse we all heard our mama or our grandma or somebody say. It's a verse that we all know, but isn't it interesting? It's a verse that we so often ignore. Why do we seem to think that we are the insulated ones, that it will affect everyone else but me? And yet the Bible says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Now, underline the word deceived, please. Because does that not then underlyingly suggest to us that we think we're the ones it's not speaking to? The only reason why it says don't be deceived is because people are deceived. Oh, you're with me this morning. They're deceived. We seem to think now, hey, I can hang out with, and we've talked about it so many times, I don't, I don't have the time to go in there, but when people move here with an accent and then they learn, you know, pigeon, and, and I got some friends in here, like I said, you know, that are, 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 that are here this morning from Molokai, and, and you know, we had this one guy from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and he came, and within two months being on Molokai, it was the worst thing I ever heard. <laughs> Southern fried pigeon. <laughs> Y'all gonna bring the con? Chemo, come to my house. Left some pork butt. <laughs> Serious. We're just like going, oh, brother, how is this? You take on the flavor of your environment. You put water in a milk, plastic milk carton, leave it there for a week, rinse off after surfing, take a drink. Ugh, you have tasted plastic milk. The water has taken on the flavor of its environment. Now you say to me, but wait a minute, pastor. We need to be a light into the darkness. We need, yes, you see, the difference is company. Company is something that stays, something that sticks with. I am to be a light in the dark. We're going to see that in a moment, so I'm not going to bang that too much. But you and I both know what is the balance of where are you getting your input? Are you on the mission field here? Yes, wonderfully. But what are the things that you are spending time with, dwelling with, whether it be television, whether it be movies, whether it be friends, this kind of company is going to corrupt good morals. Please, dear ones, please, Christians, don't think that the word company only refers to persons. What's on your iPod right now? Push it, push it real good. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> and then you're wondering why, you know, Lord, I just don't understand why I can't remember Scripture. And yet Bob here, who is seeing impaired, he has the privilege because he recognizes it to get the Bible on CD. I gave it to him. He listens to it. And so he can go through the entire book of Hebrews on a bus ride to come to church. What are we doing with our company, that which is influencing us? Did I make my point? There is a balance that we need to have. That's why verse 34, he says this to us. And I think we need to take it on the chin this morning. He says, become sober minded. As you ought. I want to suggest you underline that. He's saying this is our Juliana. This is our responsibility. As you ought. And stop sinning. How do you really feel, Paul? Can you get any straighter? Be sober minded as you ought and stop sinning. Now, if you got room somewhere, put the word poeo. We talked about this in 1 John. P-O-E-O. Poeo, that is the word practicing lawlessness. That is what Paul is referencing here. Do I sin? Yes. But do I lead out with an intention to sin? No. 
And the Bible says those who practice lawlessness are not born again. If you know it and you desire it and you're going out after it and saying, oh, I'm calling evil good and good evil, that's the poeo. And he says, you're not born again. I am not African American. I'm almost 100% Scotch Irish. Thank you, Lassie. I am who I am. And you see, the point that he's saying here is, do not just continue saying, why? Well, notice what it says. For some have no knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. I'm sure you've heard it said. I'll say it again. We may be the only Bible that somebody's reading. Especially in this less literate day. You know how many times my wife and I have gone to estate sales and the first thing they're giving away totally cheap is the family Bibles? I stack them up. You guys have helped me move. You've seen it. I got a collection that'll go all the way around a 10 by 10 room, all around of Bibles that I picked up. And to me, I grab these Bibles because the notes and the markings and the highlights in them are of sermons of saints who have gone on before me and held the torch. And I go right and I grab these books and I hold on to these Bibles that families are like, ah, we don't need that anymore. You see, we may be the only Bible that someone's actually reading. What kind of gospel are they getting? Paul is saying to this Corinthian church that was struggling with compromise, was struggling with a lot of, hey, if it feels good, it must be okay. A lot of rationalism that when we rationalize, it's just rational. So when they were dealing well with all this, he was trying to say, guys, wake up. Christianity is taught. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But Christianity is also caught. It is taught and caught. People are going to want to see the evidence of God in our lives. Look overhead if you would. Paul said it this way in Ephesians 5.15. He says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. Romans 10.13 says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And, are, and how shall they preach, excuse me, unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. You see... I love it when we see folks' lives getting touched weekly in the services. I love it at the end of the services when people's hands are going up and they're stepping from darkness into light, from an eternity of separation into an eternity of promise and hope and deliverance. That is a blessing in my heart. But I will share with you quite honestly, I am far more blessed when I hear of people getting saved after hours. When someone comes up to me and says, hey, here's my coworker, here's my cousin, here's my friend. We prayed this week. Hey, they prayed with me in Alamoana Park yesterday to receive Jesus. Oh, Hallelujah. Because that shares with me that, that the people around me are understanding that you are the priesthood of the believers. How shall they hear without a preacher? And you are they. You all speak a bilingual language, every one of you. You speak the word of God if you're a Christian, and you speak your family ease, mechanic ease, uh, uh, hostess ease, whatever the ease is, you speak them. And God is saying, you come here to get filled and to fed and to go forth and bring it out. He says, be sober minded as you ought and stop, stop sinning. You see, when we're at work and someone gets us upset and we just want to go. Wait a minute, Lord, that will have a ripple effect upon the very implementation of your word into these people's lives. For a greater and higher reason, I will hold my temper. I don't know about you, but it definitely helps me remain a lot more calm on the road when I recognize that it might be you who's going to be sitting in church the very next week and go, hey, that's the guy. <laughs> and so I'm like, wow, okay. I hear you, Lord. You need to bring it down. Don't get so hostile. Don't get so selfish and self-centered and so on and so forth. We have a life to live that brings glory and honor to God so that others will know. But now verse 35, he goes on to say this. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? He says, you fool. Meaning, how foolish. 
That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, meaning you don't plant a tree or a stalk of corn. No, he goes on, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. Verse 38, but God gives it a body just as he wished and to each of the seeds a body of its own. Now, one of the questions pastors often get asked is, what about mangled human bodies? Those that have been in a fire, those that have been, uh, you know, destroyed in some form of a car crash or explosion, or maybe even cremation. What does the Bible say about these circumstances, Pastor? What about the resurrection of the body? There are Christians who might have been fearful of things happening to them or themselves being cremated because of the body. Basically, the question is, how are the dead raised up and with what kind of body? Well, these are very natural questions for us to ask, but we must understand that we are coming from only a natural understanding of life. And so our limitations, i.e. a body that needs to have clothing to stay warm, roof and shelter, these types of things are what we need in an earthly realm. And so we have these questions. But Paul's going to take on these questions in this chapter. And if you look overhead, he's going to, first of all, he's going to talk about how are the dead raised up? He's going to talk about with what kind of body do they come? And then what is the eternal distinction? And that's what I want to share with us real quickly today on this hope and this promise that you and I have so that I can live a life in such a way that's going to cause someone to ask me, what is it that I have? And that I can share with them, I have a hope of that which is in the present and that which is the eternal that man cannot take away. Amen? And that's what we want to look at today. So first thing he begins to talk about is the explanation of a simple seed. Understand with me this. You do not plant an apple tree. You plant an apple seed. Okay. You look at the seed and here's the thing that I wrote down. An apple tree and an apple seed are distinctly different and yet they are absolutely connected. Are you following me? If you plant an apple seed, you're not going to get a papaya tree. Apple seed is apple tree. They are distinct and yet absolutely connected. You see, that's what's going on. And God is saying through Paul, he's saying that the seed is put in the ground and it dies. And once that seed is put in the ground and it dies, then it becomes its transformed state. Paul is saying that if you can't even believe in the resurrection, then you can't believe in harvest. Because we've all seen some transformation of some miracle of life coming from death when something that looks like this comes out like this. And I'm so amazed by that. You know, someone used to ask this question, and I loved it. They would say, you know, how many apples in a seed? Uh, 10, 20, 25. Then they would say, but how many? Yeah, how many seeds in an apple? There we go. <laughs> Twist. How many seeds in an apple? 10, 20. But then how many apples in a seed? That's countless. It's countless. And all the DNA and all you smart botany people could go off for hours on that. But that's not me. I skipped that class. All right. Now, the point is this. Don't get lost, Paul is saying, when he says, you fool, oh foolish one. Naive is another way of translating it. He's saying, let's not get lost in what we don't understand. I want to help us today understand something really important. My limitation is not God's. Amen? Amen. My limitation is not God's. I don't know how many times I've been witnessing to somebody when they've said, well, I just can't see how that works. And I just lovingly say, and your point is? Because can you, dear one, who that might be where you're at today, I don't get this whole resurrection thing. I don't get this forgiveness thing. I don't get this there's only one way thing. If God is this universal and awesome and all-sufficient God, why would he cause himself to be solely found in one religion? No, no, the religion has come around the one truth. It's not that we have this religion and we made the one truth. What we're called as one is because we've gathered behind the one truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? So it's a promise. It is a truth. You are either here or not. You are either breathing or not. You're either agreeing or not. You're either my wife or not. And you are saying amen on that one. And so why is there not a God or not, a heaven or not, a hell or not, or a way or not? And so Paul is calling us to understand that with every pattern is the pattern maker. 
And so he's bringing them to this understanding of, listen, here are the things that we ourselves cannot understand. We don't know exactly what happens when a seed goes in the ground, but if we continue to water it, it comes up a tree. You get in a vehicle every day and you put your key in and you turn it this way. I'd be willing to bet that 99% of us in this room don't know what happens and why it happens, but we trust it to happen. You following me? That little spark hits a solenoid, solenoid hits out the flywheel, flywheel goes vroom, vroom, vroom. Rods and pistons are going vroom, 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 vroom. Have I impressed you yet? Okay, see, all this goes on because it's a simple turning of a key. But what do we do? We go and we turn it. It doesn't work. <laughs> Daddy, come quick. Why? Why? Jiggling the battery. Oh, hallelujah. All these little simple things. Do we understand the principle of it? No. Yet we put our life in it every day. And forgive me for being so bold, but how dare you be such a hypocrite that you will get on a plane that you cannot explain how it works. How does that big heavy thing with things like this go up? You get in a car and drive 25, 35, 65, an hour. Your very life is in its hands, and yet I don't explain it. I, don't, I can't understand it all. But here's the thing that I love, and this is a quote that Tom Skinner, the famous football player who later became a Christian in his life after winning every award that he could and still not being satisfied, Tom Skinner said this, I spent a long time trying to give, to come to grips with my doubts when suddenly I realized I had better come to grip with what I believe. I have since moved from the agony of questions I cannot answer to the reality of answers I cannot escape. See, today you were fearfully and wonderfully made. Today you were brought by God, not by a friend, by God here to this very place. Maybe you're channel surfing today and you're watching. The Lord brought you to this channel. Not the fact that you're looking at some cuckoo who can't even find pants. That's not what made you stop. The Holy Spirit is calling you and saying, listen. I made you fearfully and wonderfully and inside you are all the wonderful DNA of that which I want to blossom in and of and through you. You see, here's the thing. Good seed must die first. It must come in contact with the soil. And so I'm going to ask the Christians in this room this very simple question, and that is this. Guys, God wants to do a new thing in your life. Are you ready to die to the old? See, that's the question that we need to ask this morning. As we go to the communion tables, as we represent, as we go up there and we see that which is represented where Jesus says, this is my body, I'm going to lay down my life, I'm going to die that you might live. I want us to walk to that table today in our act of worship and say, Lord Jesus, I want whatever you want from me, nothing more, nothing less. And you want to do a new thing in me, then Lord, I am willingly taking that which represents your body and your blood, recognizing that as you have died, Lord, may I do the same. I want to be a good seed that's willing to die that I might grow to the tree that you've planted. Amen? I don't want to be in conflict with that. So what kind of body do we get when we come back? Check it out. <clears throat> Verse 39. Verse 39 says this, All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts and another flesh of birds and another flesh of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. Now, let's notice it. Logically, we have different bodies and different skin from dogs and fish. If you've ever scaled a fish, you know that looks different than a human. And so Paul is saying, hey, listen, we all have different types of skin, he argues. And so he says, so also there are earthly bodies and there are heavenly bodies. Now, can I have your eyes this way for a second? Especially all of you ladies, I want you to know this, okay? When he's talking about heavenly bodies, that's not talking about what you think he's talking about. <laughs> Guys, heavenly bodies he's talking about is that we have this te terrestrial, this temporal thing that God has made us in this body. We've been given this, but this is doing nothing but getting older. The scars all over our bodies. My wife loves photo albums. I tell her I don't need photo albums. I have scars. Oh, I remember this. I remember. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that was the launch that I did on the BMX bike and the handlebars came up mid-air. 
all these different things upon our bodies. And see, we recognize that with every pattern is a pattern maker. And so when he's saying there's a difference in bodies, there is a heavenly body that is going to be distinct yet connected and an earthly body which is distinct and connected. We need to recognize that. So join me verse 44 or 41 and I'll make my point. He goes on to say this. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For stars differ from stars in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, but it is raised an imperishable body. Isn't it amazing? There are no two people that are alike. There are no two stars that are alike. Did you know that there is no two signatures that are alike? You ever tried to do that? You ever tried to practice your signature? And make it look alike and just do it over and over. I guess you listened in class. Okay, anyways. Trying just to sign your name. These things he's saying, there is a distinction in that which is God has made. There is a different glory in every single one of them. Paul is preaching this, and I want you to hear this. Paul is saying this, that our distinctive will not be wiped out. What is uniquely us will remain. Okay, Christians, I just answered a huge question for you. So let me have your attention to get this clear. When we die, will we get a new body? Yes. Hallelujah. Oh. I am going to be given a new and eternal body, a body that is not made for the finite things of this world. I will be given to have an earthly body and then I will be given this heavenly body, this celestial body that God is going to give to us. Hallelujah. But the beautiful thing is, is He's saying to us, that the glory, the distinction of who I am will remain. Thus, I will be recognizable to my friends and family in heaven. And that's a question. People, Are we just going to be spirits floating around, bumping into one another? Oh, excuse me. Oh. No. Jesus came back and he said, brah, like eat. It's in John, check it out. And when he ate the fish, it wasn't like Pirates of the Caribbean where it just poof fell to the ground. <laughs> it went into his body. And he rose in a body, in a bodily form, the scriptures say. And so shall you and I. We will be given something glorious and new, and I can't wait to see what it is, but our distinctives will be clearly who we are. And that is why in verse 43 it says, It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. You see, by now, all of us in here have begun to see the decay of this corruptible body. It was kind of funny, just this week I was talking to somebody who's 20-something. And this 20-something-year-old was talking about their body changing. And this 40-something was sitting there going, mm-hmm. <laughs> and this 20-something-year-old was talking about how all of a sudden the tapeworm that lived in them all these years just died. <laughs> <laughs> because before they could eat and eat and eat. And by the way, this was the wahine I was talking to. And she could pound, and there was no damage control whatsoever needed. And now at 20-something, she eats and fills it. Now, I remember for me when that started to happen, I was right around 27, 28, right around the 30 mark, and I first started accusing my wife of shrinking all of my clothes. <laughs> what are you doing, girl? Look at my shorts. You're shrinking them. I have not changed the way that I watched him in the last 10 years. No, act. That's what we do as men. We blame the, the clothes. But I begin to recognize the decay. You know, I stand in front of you as a body that is just, oh. My wife says, it's not the years, it's the mileage. But, you know, as most of you know, you know, the, the blown out fake knee, the titanium from here to here that I have, the fake tooth, the carpal tunnel, the neck displacement, the, uh, never mind. Messed up boy. But you know what that does? That means when I wake up in the morning, I groan for glory. <laughs> oh, rapture now, Jesus! No, I'll find another day. Ah, I'll call my chiropractor. Ah. Christian, 
I'm telling you today that God has promised that we will not forever be in this state and that death is not a door that closes, it one that opens and I get a new and improved. Amen? <laughs> so live your life to the fullest. Ride motorcycles. Okay, no. <laughs> Charge big waves. Yeah. No, we do want to be uh, very careful with the precious gift of life. But death, it has no sting. It has no sting whatsoever. You see, look overhead, guys. In this body, we have sinned. But in that body, we will be made perfect. In this body, we have failed. But in that body, we shall love and obey God without fault. Oh, hallelujah. In this body, we have been weak and full of troubles. In that body, we shall be free of all defects. Yeah, go ahead. Now, what's he saying? Paul is basically saying that this temporal body, like the seed, anything that is of the terrestrial kingdom, is temporal. And it's amazing how much money people are spending on time and energy to take care of this body when they haven't even prepared that which is eternal, and that's their soul. I have given clear instructions for my funeral. I'm not morbid. I'm doing what the Bible says. I'm planning. Okay, Irish are a little morbid. Anyway, so my wife knows if she is to be there and if she and I go together, I got Teva and other friends here who've heard this so many times, Blevins, they know what to do. I want to be put in a pine cheap box, lid open, cardboard sign in my hand, forced smile that goes... And I want that cardboard sign to say, moved. <laughs> That's it! This brother has moved. No longer bound by the limitations of this body. Ugh. God has blessed me and allowed me to inherit and be His inheritance. How does that sound? It sounds amazing. Ben Franklin put it this way. Look at this quote overhead. This is on Ben's tombstone. The body of Ben Franklin, printer. Like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding. Lies here, food for worms. But the work will not be lost, for it will appear once more in a new and more elegant edition, revised and corrected by the author. All right. All right. Let's finish this section here for today. Verse 44. Verse 44, back in 1 Corinthians 15. says this. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural man, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. And the last Adam, we learned last week was Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. However... The spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. Verse 47, the first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. And is the earthy, so are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so are also those who are heavenly. And just as we have been born the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. You see, he's saying to us, what is everlasting, what is eternal is that soul within us, and that soul is going to move on to that new place. And that which is temporal, that which is perishing, that which is from Adam, hey, let's do the best with it, what we got. But have we prepared for that place where we will spend eternity? You see, the first man, it says, is from earth. The second man is from heaven. Now, who were Adam's parents? None. He didn't have any parents. And yet the Bible calls him as earth. Why? Because he is from the earth, from the ashes and from the dust. God brought him together. But Jesus, it says Jesus is from the heaven. Why? Because he said himself, he said, before Abraham was, I am. The man that he was speaking about was not the tent, but the soul. And that is where I need your attention right now today. Hear me clearly on this. What a lot of Christians forget, misunderstand, is this. Every single person, you guys watching TV, anyone around, anyone will hear, every single person, according to the Bible, when they die, will be given an eternal body. 
an everlasting body, a new body, whether you are Christian or not. The question is, where will you spend eternity in that body? You see, and I don't mean this to be funny, but heaven, death, afterlife, it, your life after you close your eyes on this earth is either an eternal joy or an everlasting bummer. It really is. And that is why we should have a conviction as Christians to believe this. If you're going to clap with me and go, yay, we got new bodies, we can have an everlasting body, then our hearts should yearn for those who also have an everlasting body but don't know where it's being spent. Amen? How will they hear without a preacher? Now they preach unless they're sent. Now I'm stoked these guys that are going to Mongolia. Try the barbecue, I hear it's great. Never mind. Indonesia, Nepal. But remember, a missionary is not just one who crosses the sea, but someone who sees the cross. And if you're here this morning, I may be doing a horrible job at it, but what I'm trying to tell you is that He loves you, that we have a sin problem, and you can call yourself what you want to call yourself, but if He does not call you His child because you have not said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, be my Lord and Savior, and I want to follow your word, your will, and your way. Not pick and choosing because then I'm still God. God is not His name, it's His. And if it's His job description, if God is God, then have we submitted, have we surrendered today to that Godship and said, God, I receive your forgiveness. And with that forgiveness, with my name we looked last week in the book of life, then that is where I will spend eternity with you. Hallelujah, Jesus. But Lord God, give my heart a yearning for those who do not yet know for sure that if closing their eyes tonight is a good thing. You see, we need to be people who care. Clearly, who care. You see, the substitution, the old Adam, the new Adam, it has been made. Now comes the responsibility. And thus, my last verse for us this morning is this. Verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And the point is this. Please hear me. If we are to bear the image of the heavenly body, we must possess, not profess, a heavenly life now. Do you and I possess a heavenly life now? Is it recognizable? You see, a Rwandan pastor who was threatened to change his faith and to quit proclaiming Jesus Christ by the militants that were around him of an opposing faith. They said, change your faith or die. And in 1980, this young pastor put this on his door after being told to change or die. He wrote, and I quote, I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed vision, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. My face is set, my gate is fast, and my goal is heaven. My road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide is reliable, my mission is clear. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I have stayed up, stored up, and prayed up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I must go till He comes, give till I drop, preach till everyone knows, work till he stops me, and when he comes for his own, he will have no trouble recognizing me because my banner will have been clear. Amen? It's kind of wordy, but try to put that on your business card. You know how much guys go, oh, you know, I don't really want to put a fish on my card because, you know, I might lose business. Really? Tell you what, don't put a fish in your card if you're not going to do godly business and business a godly way. But are we going to recognize that flesh and blood, this being a good person, that's great. I'm glad you're a good person. A good person isn't your soul. And has your soul been handed over the keys to your eternity to Jesus Christ? You see, you've all heard the many poems that life is just the dash. My birthday, 1964, dash, 
the day God calls me home. My entire life is in just one little thing right there. How have we spent our dash? That is going to have significant impact on our eternity and the eternity of those around us. Very important. Many of you have had to deal with the loss of loved ones. Many of you have been told that you have battled or battling with a terminal disease. This is an apparent true story of a woman who was given that news and the reality came. And I want to close with this. There was a woman who had been diagnosed with cancer. Her doctor told her to start making preparations to die. So she contacted her pastor and had him come to her house and discuss certain aspects of her funeral. She told him which song she wanted to be sung at the service, what scripture she would like to be read. And the woman also told her pastor that she wanted to be buried with her favorite Bible. Everything was in order and the pastor was preparing to leave when the woman suddenly remembered something very strange. The pastor stood looking at the woman, not knowing quite why the woman had asked for this. Well, said the woman, in all my years of attending church socials and functions where food was involved, and let's be honest, food is a very important part of every church and every event, just like us afterwards. My favorite part was when whoever was clearing away the dishes of the main course would lean over and say, you can keep your fork. It was my favorite part because I knew something better was coming. When I told them, when they told me to keep my fork, I knew it wasn't jello. Something with substance was coming. So I just want people to see me there in the casket with a fork in my hand. <laughs> and I want them to wonder, what's with the fork? Then I want you to tell them, Pastor, something better is coming. The pastor's eyes welled up with tears of joy as he hugged her, and he knew this would be one of their last hugs. But he also knew that this woman had a better grasp on heaven than he did. At the funeral, people were walking up at the woman's casket, and they saw the pretty dress she was wearing in her favorite Bible and the fork in her hand. Over and over, they commented about the fork, and over and over, he smiled. During his message, the pastor told the people of the conversation he had with the woman shortly before she died. He also told them about the fork and what it meant. The pastor told the people how he could not stop thinking about the fork and told them that they probably would not be able to stop thinking about it either. So the next time you reach down for your fork, let it remind you, O Christian, so gently that there is something better coming. Amen? So, amen. So now you understand the last part. I want the cardboard sign holding with the fork sticking out on the side. <laughs> and so now here's my question for us. As I've done in the past, I will do here again. Jesus loves every one of you. Christians, do you agree? Amen. We know that God has a plan, a plan to prosper and not to harm, to give us a hope and a future. That's God's word and that's God's promise. You've been in a room for an hour. Some of you say maybe it felt like it was longer than that. You were drugged here maybe by a friend and you can't wait to get out. Okay, we're almost done. We're going to worship as Christians do because we're not worshiping the principle, the message, the message giver. We're worshiping the author and the finisher of our faith and that's Jesus Christ. And that's why we're going to sing. But I'm going to give you a chance right here and now in this room. Do you know? Do you know? I'm putting these on because I want to see you. Do you know that where you will spend eternity is heaven? Do you know that you have said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and be now my Lord and Savior? You see, there's a room full of people right now in here that are praying for you. That are saying it's the best decision they ever made. Amen? Amen. What a joy it is to live my life with a win-win, knowing if I live, I win. If I die, I win. For I step into some place that is better. I have the fork of faith. And so today, if you are here with us this morning and God has been ministering to you during this message with every head up and with every eye opened so that you know that you know that this is the decision I need to make, that I want to step into a confidence and assurance of being forgiven of my sin and forever having Jesus Christ hold the keys to my eternity, that when I step from this life, I step into eternity with him. If that is the step you need to make today in faith and saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I want to give you that opportunity to do it right now. And I'm going to ask you to do something very bold, and that is just stick up your hand and say, Pastor, today is my day. Pray with me. And these people are going to rejoice with you. So if you're here, would you do that now? Raise your hand. Go ahead and hold it up. Amen. Right there. And praise God. Who else? Come on. Who else? 
Hold it high. Amen. Anybody else? Praise God. Amen.